So the BSA Gold Star and the Interceptor 650 Royal Enfield are based on models of old. They're based on these granddads. And we're here today at the National Motorcycle Museum with James Hewing to talk about what these bikes were like back in the day. So thanks very much for being on our video. No problem, Neves. <laughs> Good to see you. And you. So tell us a little bit about these bikes here. I mean, they are fantastic, first of all. But... Yeah, I mean, we've got, um, as you say, we've got the two grandfathers, if you like, of yeah. these bikes. We've got uh, a 1959 DBD 34 Gold Star in touring trim which is the nearest thing really to the the modern version of the gold star so when i say touring trim it's not in clubman's trim clubman's trim you would think of as having the rear sets and the um uh, and the drop bars yep. uh, the clip-ons um, and so this is the nearest sort of bike um all busy albeit all those decades apart to um to the gold star yeah and then with the royal enfield um interceptor um you've got your modern interceptor there that you've got on test at the moment and we've got our 1968 um mark ii interceptor um went through various guys as the the uh, the enfield interceptor from the early 60s with the mark one the mark 1a the mark ii this interestingly is actually the the pre-production prototype wow um for the mark ii interceptor on which the, the modern interceptor styling wise is is loosely based um, but in terms of being a pre-production prototype it's no different really aesthetically it looks no different yeah. to um to to the bikes that went into production and that, that got sold to the, the public yeah so back in the day where would these bikes sit in the biking world would, it, would this be a fire blade for example i, I tell you what yeah if we think about the Gold Star, because most riders, even riders that don't know a lot about old, old machines, they will have heard the word Gold Star, even yeah. before the new one came out. Um, and single cylinder, obviously, but um, really pretty much the, uh, the R1 or the Fireblade of the wow. day. Yeah, it, it was the sporting machine or yeah. one of the sporting machines alongside twins like the Triumph Bonneville that came out you know, around the same time. So people all think 1958, 1959, Triumph Bonneville has been the sporting twin, and this was really the sporting single. So in, in one respect, very much the Fireblade yeah. of, its, of its day of the late 50s, early 60s, yeah. Would it have been priced that way? Would it have been one of the more expensive motorcycles on the road? Yeah, absolutely. So it was one of BSA's um, most expensive models in their range and of course bsa had a big range of bikes a yeah. huge range um everything from 125 cc upwards um up to um at that time up to 650 cc so and, and or everything in between every capacity in between so it really topped off pretty much in yeah. the late 50s that that huge range range of bikes in terms of it being their most sporting bike pretty much but also being the most expensive yeah. yeah bsa is probably one of the most iconic badges for people that know a little bit about bikes i suppose along with norton and triumph royal enfield perhaps not so much so where did this kind of fit back in the day what was this regarded as yeah the interceptor i mean for me um one of the best looking bikes of of, of the 1960s especially the later mark ii's there um, with the chrome tank and, and what have you, I think personally, and I think a lot of people would agree, sitting here, mm. you know, with it sitting here shining in the sun today, what an amazing looking amazing, bike. Yeah. Royal Enfield, certainly not one of the, the biggest manufacturers of, of the old British industry. Um, little bit niche in in in, in some ways but um, they've got an aging product range and so in the early 60s they came out with the the interceptor which was loosely based on some earlier models but um by the late 60s i mean they've sold a lot in america certainly towards the end most went for export yeah and there's a lot come back today people re-import yeah, them in, yeah. in various uh, in various states of disrepair for for restoration so a lot of that mark ii production um yeah. went abroad but um sold in america as a real big 
big capacity 750cc road burner so that was when a lot of the British manufacturers like Triumph or BSA were still making 650s but there was a big clamour from the American market for a little bit bigger capacity for right. 750s yeah, yeah. and so really sold as a, as a road burner in, in the United States um, especially it claimed to produce about 55 horsepower so doesn't sound a lot by today's no. standards but certainly um, you know at that time it was a, a reasonable output so it yeah. would have been a performance bike in its day absolutely a yeah. performance bike and if you look at any of that contemporary advertising from back then it was really sold as that yeah. high performance as i say road burner as as yeah. the americans would 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 have said at the time yeah and quite pricey in the yeah day. again they weren't um, they weren't a cheap bike um, but they were comparative with you know the contemporary with competition at the time with BSAs and big capacity BSAs, big capacity uh, Triumphs. But I think you make a good point there. Lesser known, um, a yeah. little bit lesser known than the Nortons, the Triumphs and, and, and the BSAs. Yeah. A little bit more niche. Brilliant. Well, I really appreciate your opinions. And if you want to come to the National Motorcycle Museum and see bikes like the BSA and Royal Enfield, there's hundreds. How many are in there? We've nearly a thousand bikes wow. in the collection altogether. Yeah, we've got some in storage, but most things are on display. And yeah. we have some bikes out on loan, but um, five halls um, yeah. crammed with bikes. And yeah. um, you can see, oh, well, it's actually 171 different British wow. marks that we've got. And, and within that, the big manufacturers like BSAs, we've got 60, 70 BSAs. And, you know, with the big manufacturers, we've got a lot of examples of, of what they made over yeah, yeah. Uh, over the course of the last century. And in, in, indeed, in terms of um, BSA, we've got um, we've got modern BSAs and modern Triumphs. So it's not like the museum sort of ends in the mid 1970s no. or the, the very early 1980s. We've got modern Hinkley Triumphs. So we've come right up to date, yeah, really. Yeah. Well worth a visit. Well worth a probably a day or two of your time. But anyway, that's enough about that. Back to work and we're going to see what these two new bikes are like to ride. Performance wise, these two bikes are very, very similar, which shouldn't come as too much of a surprise because they're both 650 cc's. However, one is a single and one is a twin. But we've dynoed both of these bikes at BSD um, and the results are really surprising. So. The BSA makes slightly less power and slightly less torque than this, but not much. But what's most surprising is, is the power deliveries. So this makes 42 bhp, this makes 43 bhp at the back wheel. This has got a lot more power lower down the revs. And this has got a little bit more up the top, which you'd, you'd expect with more cylinders. This is smoother as well. And this, it's the same story with torque. This is 38. Um, pound foot of torque and this is 40 and again the the meat of the the torque is delivered at lower revs on this one um, and that's what you really feel on the road this engine is a little bit more characterful than the Royal Enfield it's got that nice throb to it it's got that nice retro feel to it whereas the Enfield engine is is very smooth and sophisticated um, this has got a little bit more initial acceleration and this one takes a little bit longer to spool up. Um, that makes this more involving to ride on the road. And this is a, I guess, if you are coming from a modern bike or a sports bike, this is the one that's going to kind of be instantly more familiar and easier and nicer to get on with. This is a little bit more ploddy, but I think it's more true to the original. So performance character, engine character aside, what these bikes used to be all about back in the day was whether they could do over a ton, over a hundred mile an hour. And whether if you own one of these bikes, you'd be a member of the Ton Up Club. Now, can these bikes do hundred mile an hour today with just 40, 42 horsepower? Well, to answer that question, we've come to a runway and um, we shot down the runway a few times and um, head down on the tank wound them through the gears and they just about do 100 miles an hour and in fact just like the engine power and all the rest of it these two are really really similar we'll have to check the GoPro footage to see exactly how fast they were going because the digits 
<laughs> the digits on the speedo are so small that I could barely read them accurately. But I would say that through squinted eyes, the, um, they both do about 105 miles an hour. Obviously that's on the clock. We haven't put any GPS equipment on them, nor would you have done back in the day. So you know, as far as you're concerned when you're riding them, these bikes would do over 100 mile an hour. So that's kind of a big tick, isn't it? As well as performance, we tested braking performance as well. So at the launch, it was clear that the BSA brakes were really good and the Royal Enfield brakes perhaps aren't quite there. So we decided to put it to the test. We use this sign behind us as a braking marker, third gear, 60 miles an hour, and broke as hard as we could. Um, started off on the, the BSA and it stopped really well. Not a lot of ABS intrusion. The track's completely dry today, even though it's really, really cold, it's barely above freezing. But this has got half decent tires on it, good brakes, good ABS, and it stopped really well. And we decided to bring our old friend Elvis along to, uh, to stand there while uh, I went off on the Royal Enfield to, to, to test the brakes on that. Um, and you can see the results, the, the infield doesn't stop as well as the, the BSA. And poor old Elvis got a bit of a shoulder barge, so sorry about that Elvis. Um, and the reasons are, there's no real reason why the brakes should be any worse. So, you know, the brake specs very similar, but I think some of it is down to the tyres on this bike, which are pretty poor really. If this was my bike, I'd put really nice tyres on it. But like we said throughout this, these are built down to a price. And maybe the ABS is a little bit too intrusive. Um, but, you know, there's not, there wasn't a great deal in it, was there, Elvis? Uh -huh. So these bikes are built down to a price. But does that mean the suspension is built down to a price too? How do they ride when you're going down your favourite little country road in the morning? So, the best way to find out, obviously, is to strap uh, jars full of strawberry milkshake to the back of the bikes. So that's exactly what we've done. We've got strawberry milkshake with um, semi-skimmed milk. Um, we've also put marshmallows in the top as well, just to really kind of drill down the, the compression and rebound damping rates, where the preload's at, the spring rates, all that kind of stuff. Um, as you can see, the results are pretty conclusive of which one rides the best. There's a lot of milkshake missing out of that one and not much out of that one. The way we conducted the test was we did a little kind of two mile run down this country road at 40 mile an hour on each bike. Um, the Enfield didn't lose much milkshake and the BSA really did at that point. And then we had a more spirited ride at the national speed limit um, where this really got out of shape and that didn't. Um, we know from the launch last year that the BSA's kind of weak point is the handling really. The suspension is underdamped. It's quite crashy over bumps as well. So as soon as you start to push on, the whole bike kind of moves and twists, which you can see from the milkshake. And the whole thing's got quite of a, a disconnected feel. The front doesn't feel connected to the rear. It doesn't flow beautifully through the corners. It feels quite awkward, um, especially when it's cold before the tires are warmed up. I mean, the tires are pretty basic. I think both bikes would uh, benefit from proper tyres but that's all part of the cost cutting exercise. I think the brakes are better on the BSA as well but generally the ride quality isn't as good as the Royal Enfield. So we've raved about the Royal Enfield Interceptor 650 for years for good reason. It's a very affordable, very stylish retro that handles beautifully. Okay the suspension is built down to the price, you can't adjust it apart from the rear preload but it's been set to perfection. And you can tell from the milkshake, I mean, there's not a lot missing, 
on the first run there's hardly any missing at all still got a few marshmallows left which are lovely um, and the, the way that the bike flows through corners it feels it feels really really nice it feels lovely at low speed it's just feel it just floats along and then when you start up in the ante um, it, it it talks to you it, it steers beautifully you know you can tell that this bike was developed by a lot of former Triumph employees from designers to test riders to everything in between and it really shows the brakes aren't quite as good as the BSAs um, but in terms of ride quality handling and kind of enjoyment on these back roads the milkshake says that the Royal Enfield is the best one so there's a couple of questions that remain number one have BSA created a decent retro yes they definitely have it's been worth the wait it's been a little bit of a rocky road getting here it's been a long time between when we rode this bike at the launch and now probably about six months or so um, I'm really glad bikes like this exist I mean you know this is one of the the, the big names as we talked about before at the motorcycle museum you know BSA Triumph Norton they're the, the big Brit names and it's fantastic that they've they've come back and that they're so popular. This bike has had hundreds and hundreds of pre-orders in the UK alone. Elvis nearly went then. Um, which just shows what an appetite people have got for these kind of bikes. And it's funny really because, you know, th this is based on a 60s bike. We're in the 2020s now. And you're kind of almost back to where you started. And, you know, you kind of wonder what the point of all that motorcycle evolution was. What was the point of making all that more extra power, putting electronics on, making the tyres better, where we've just kind of ridden that wave and now we're back to where we were. So it's really interesting. You know, bikes like these are just really enjoyable bikes. They just feel good bikes. Um, so the Royal Enfield has been our class leading retro for years and years and years. And I think if I was going to buy one of these two I would probably go for the Enfield I'd stick some decent tires on it for for one but I like the Enfield because it feels like a modern bike that looks old so the handling on it I really really love um, it's fast enough it does over 100 miles an hour um, it's kind of got a lot of nice detail touches it looks a little bit like the older bike um, and I just think it's as a riding experience more enjoyable having said that i would go towards the bsa for that kind of authentic bsa old school british riding experience okay it doesn't handle as well as we saw when it lost all its milkshake and um, through those bumpy country roads um, but what i love about this bike is is the engine the engine makes this bike you know the single cylinder engine it's got a lot of torque it's got a lot of character it's it's every bit as fast as the the enfield it's got better brakes and better detailing i mean it's a it's pretty much they're both built in a similar way you could point to some parts of the bike and think they're a bit shoddy on on both bikes and some parts that are fantastically detailed you know these clocks, the, the way the, the clocks emulate the, the clocks on the old bike, the way they kind of, they start at, at two o'clock and then, and then work around. Lots of really lovely detail touches. So I think if I was just riding a bike for like a, a Sunday morning plod or riding through London to go to the bike shed and, you know, just wanted to feel good with an open face crash helmet on, I'd probably plump for the BSA. But, you know, they're, they're really close in performance. They're really close in kind of spirit. And uh, I think 2023 is going to be the year of these British bikes and, you know, really capturing the imagination of, of riders. And uh, yeah, I tip my hat to these for existing. And I want to thank Elvis for coming along to help us with our braking test. Oh. I can leave the building now.